the end of the day, I like to, to count things, and people who, who know me actually know that this is really a lie. You know, it's only rarely that I really come back and count things. Um, but we are going to count some things today. So I've been trying to convince you that uh, when we're counting things, reflection groups are, are very interesting, <coughs> that they give us interesting generalizations of uh, symmetric group objects. Many of the objects that we usually count are really in type A, and they have interesting generalizations to finite reflection groups, finite real reflection groups, sometimes complex reflection groups. And that the invariant theory that distinguishes com complex reflection groups, reflection groups generally, is what gives us interesting cues. The cues uh, tend to have more meaning when they come from gradings and invariant rings and polynomial algebras. So one instance of this are the Catalan numbers. They definitely have an interesting general, generalization to all finite real reflection groups and even some complex reflection groups. And I'm going to tell you about the, the WQ Catalan. We already talked about the Q Catalan of type A in, in the first lecture, so I'll tell you what is the, the Q Catalan number for any finite real reflection and a bit of, about its meaning. And then I'll tell you about the GLNFQ analog, which led us to some conjectures which are very mysterious, and I'm hoping people here you know about Lie theory and other such things will uh, will give us some insight into these these really strange Q analog conjectures for GL and FQ. Again, thought of as a, a reflection group. So that's that'll be in the first half, and then in the second half, I'll talk about a different analogy between the symmetric groups and real reflection groups and GL and FQ. There's part of uh, type A theory of the symmetric group has to do with this problem of Hurwitz. Not Hurwitz, but Hurwitz. Um, so uh, back in the, the study of Riemann surfaces and branched coverings, so he understood that when you want to classify branched coverings up to a certain natural equivalence, this came down to counting factorizations within given conjugacy classes uh, within the symmetric group. And so he solved some of these problems. and. You know, since then, people have come back to, to attack more of these problems. There's one particularly nice case that I'll tell you about, the, the Golden-Jackson cactus formula. So this is one of the cases in which you're looking at genus zero co branched coverings of a sphere. So a Riemann sphere covering a Riemann sphere. Uh, we have particularly choices, uh, particular choices of monodromy permutations over the, the branch points. And these guys give a, a very nice product formula. This particular situation. And again, we kind of gotten used to now looking for GLNFQ analogs of SM, symmetric group type results. So I'll tell you about a GLNFQ analog that came up very recently. So this is now getting into things that actually really proved last month. So we are heading into um, use of work. Okay. Uh, maybe before we start, any, any uh, questions about things from before? So, we talked about the Catalan number, cat of n, it was 1 over n plus 1, 2 n choose n. And we even talked about this q Catalan number, 1 over n plus 1 sub q, 2 n choose n sub q, where these are these q analogs that we define, replacing numbers by q numbers, factorials by q factorials, and it seemed like a silly thing to do, but it, uh, it actually exhibited one of these cyclic sitting phenomena, for, remember this came up with triangulations of the n plus 2 gone up to rotation. This was the appropriate polynomial x sub q, the appropriate q analog, the q count for those triangulations that gave us something interesting. All right, so here's how you define this. Uh, let's make this bigger. For a finite real reflection group, I claim we should generalize this in the following way. So when we have W, a finite real reflection group, so it's inside of GLNR, acting irreducibly on, on V is R to the N. I'm going to define the W Catalan number to be this product. Uh, I goes from 1 to N. You take the degrees, I'm sorry, I'm hiding the definition. Remember that the S is our polynomial ring, with W acting by linear substitution on the variables. S super W is the W fixed space, the W invariant polynomials. It itself is a polynomial algebra that was very special to the reflection group case. 
And the degrees, I can always pick those F1 through Fn homogeneous. They're not unique, there are many different choices, but their degrees will be unique. No matter how you choose them homogeneously, you will get these uh, degrees, D1 up through Dn. I'm choosing to order them in, in weekly increasing order. And then H is this Coxeter number. Okay, so this is, I'm defining it here as the top degree, the largest degree of one of the basic invariants. We call that the Coxeter number H. And then this is how I'm defining my W cattle N number. So it's the product as I goes from 1 to N of the degrees on the bottom and H plus the degrees on the top. So degrees on the bottom and a shift of the degrees by the Coxeter number on the top, that product. And you know, you already might be thinking, is it a number? Is it an integer? Does it count something? It's not clear, but it turns out that it does. This isn't obvious. And even better, I'm just going to queueify it. I'm going to use that verb again. This is one of my uh, colleague Dennis Stanton's favorite verbs, queueify. I'm going to make everything with a Q number instead and call that W Q catalyte number, cat W of Q. And you should immediately be asking, is it a polynomial in Q? Is it a polynomial in Q with integer coefficients? It looks like a rational function. Does it have non-negative coefficients? Does it have any meaning? And I'll give you answers to some of these. Okay. So any, any questions so far about the definition of what W Catalan number is for a real reflection group? And W Q Catalan. Gives new meaning to queuing up the next page. <laughs> <laughs> Let me queue that up right now. Oops, let me do this. Let me uh, also just uh, check. I'm claiming that I'm generalizing something. So am I generalizing type A? Yes. Let's just do the quick check here. <coughs> type A n minus 1. So that's the symmetric group Sn. Remember, Sn is fractor Sn for me. Um, it's acting on R to the n permuting coordinates. Now, I should have said on the previous slide, did I say acting irreducibly? Yes. Be careful. When I start talking about this, some of this Catalan combinatorics, I actually want to take irreducible representations of my finite real reflection group. I want to get rid of any uh, stable subspaces. So I get into this annoyance of what happens in type A that I have to mod out by the, that line where the coordinates are all equal right, in order to make the irreducible reflection representation. And that's this subscript a n minus 1 rather than S n, you know, this n to n minus 1 is always an annoyance here to make things irreducible. And I want to be careful and do that. So S n was permuting coordinates R n, that's not irreducible, so we actually consider the action on this subspace, this hyperplane where the sum of the coordinates is 0. It's isomorphic to R n minus 1. And so really my uh, symmetric algebra, my uh, polynomial ring should be, and I'm going to start using complex coordinates. The important thing is we're working in characters from zero. I'm just extending my scalars a little. Let's not worry about that. But I need to mod out by the first elementary symmetric function, the thing that vanishes on this hyperplane. So the linear form that defines that hyperplane. This is still a polynomial algebra. And it's true that the invariant polynomials, you just take the elementary symmetric functions except for the first one, which was, has been set to zero. It's not hard to see that the fundamental theorem of elementary symmetric functions, the fundamental theorem of symmetric functions says these will alge be algebraically independent n minus 1 homogeneous elements that generate the invariants. And their degrees are 2, 3, up to n. That's written in increasing order. So the Coxeter number is n, h is n in this case, the, the highest degree. And so the what was my definition of the Catalan number? for type a n minus 1 would be the product of the degrees on the bottom, 2, 3, up through n, so that's an n factorial. The product of the shift of the degrees by h, so n plus 2, n plus 3, dot, 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 up through n plus n, so it goes up to 2n. And you can check. This is the same as our catalan. And the q catalan is the same. It's just the qification. Yes, Alan? So what does it come? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Can I? Great question. Oh, it counts. All right, that's good. That's the answer. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's the 
little bit better answer. Okay, so let's let's see something that Cat W in general for a finite real reflection group counts. So I'm crediting this to W. Basis in 2003. He actually has two papers. So we've heard a lot about his uh, paper 2006 to 2013, in which he proves that finite complex reflection groups, the complexified arrangement, the complement is k pi one. But there was a precursor paper in which he was building on work of uh, Tom Brady and Colin Watt, I think, who in type A had shown how to produce an interesting new k pi one space for uh, the type A braid groups, the classical braid groups, or good braid, braid groups. Uh, and so he figured out how you should generalize their construction in this earlier paper from 2003, the one called the dual braid monoid. He uh, observed that this product I'm talking about counted these things that I'm calling W non-crossing partitions. What's a W non-crossing partition? N C of W? Again, irreducible real reflection group. I want to talk about a Coxeter system. So remember, I was saying that finite real reflection groups happen to be the same thing as Coxeter systems in which the, the W is finite. And a Coxeter system, recall, is you have a distinct, I don't know if you can read that, but <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard to read. Coxeter system. W and capital S. The capital S is this uh, distinguished set of generators. In Ivan Morin's talk, this distinguished set of generators was you pick one of the vial chambers, you take only the reflections that bound the vial chamber, S1 through Sn, I'm calling N the, the dimension of the space in which W is acting irreducibly. And I'm going to need that Coxeter system in order to talk about a Coxeter element. Coxeter elements. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Coxeter elements is little c is the product S1 through Sn. You take the Coxeter generators in any order. I don't care what order you pick, but just fix it and write down the product of these simple reflections, the Coxeter generators. <clears throat> and it turns out that because of the nature of the presentation of finite Coxeter groups, because their Coxeter diagram is a, a tree, there's enough commutativity around, this element is defined up to W conjugacy. If you pick different orderings of the Coxeter generators, you and I will get conjugate elements of the group. And everything that I'm going to say only depends upon that little c up to conjugation. So you take this Coxeter element, and which the non-crossing partitions are, you look, in the Cayley graph for W using all reflections, not the Coxeter generators, but all reflections. So again, this is like in, in Yvonne's talk, somehow when, we're, when we go to complex reflection groups, we no longer have these nice Coxeter systems. We don't have these presentations, but we do have all reflections. That makes sense for any reflection group. And what you look at is from the identity to a Coxeter element, you look at the geodesics, you look at all of the elements that you will go through on shortest paths using all reflections from the identity to a Coxeter. That's the non-crossing partitions for W. So this is the Brady and Watt and the, the deceased uh, insight, is that this is a good thing to look at. Let's look at it for S3. For S3, so type A2, what, what am I supposed to do? I'm drawing pictures, these are like the, the functional diagrams of permutations. You see one, two, three, and each of these pictures, one, two, and three. And I've drawn the permutations just as arrows for where elements go. Here's the identity down here. And I'm drawing the Cayley graph. These edges are multiplying by reflections, which are just all transpositions. So I uh, take the identity, I multiply by the transposition one, two, I go here. Multiply by the transposition one, three, I go here. Multiply by the one. Transposition 2, 3, I go here. And then from here, I might go to, uh, I multiply by some transposition, and I went to the 3 cycle. 1 goes to 2 goes to 3. That's actually one of my Coxeter elements. So what? who are my uh, simple reflections? My adjacent transpositions are these simple reflections. They are the Coxeter generators. So you take the adjacent transpositions 1, 2, and 2, 3. Okay. 
If I multiply them in some order, I think if I multiply them 1, 2, 2, 3, and we have to establish my convention for multiplication, I will get this 3 cycle. 1 goes to 2 goes to 3. So that's one of the Coxeter elements. And I fix one. Are these Coxeter elements, can I think of them as wiring diagrams? They're, are they wiring diagrams? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, and I'm counting wiring diagrams? I mean, I think of wiring diagrams as any reduced decomposition for any permutation. Okay, for the longest cycle, right? I think the longest. Oh, no, no, no. No. For the, the, the longest element, like yeah. W naught? No, no, no. It's a different thing. That's a different thing. Yeah, those are interesting objects, too. But I think that's okay. a different story. Okay, so I have fixed this Coxeter element, and I think she, what I've drawn here is, in fact, you can see, like a partially ordered set. I mean, these edges really are the Cayley graph, and notice they're undirected, because I'm talking about a generating set in which they are involutions. Here, you know, we, if we're in a real reflection group, I'm using the reflections as generators for the group. They're their own inverse, so there's really a bi-directed edge here. You know, I can multiply by a transposition and go up, and then multiply by the same transposition and go down. So this undirected graph is a picture of the Cayley graph, the symmetric group, with respect to all transpositions. And I've actually uh, drawn it as a partially ordered set. As we go up, we are uh, decreasing the number of cycles, and really what's happening in general for any finite real reflection group is we are uh, increasing the co-dimension of the fixed space. So here's the identity at the bottom. Its fixed space is the whole space. Co-dimension is zero for its fixed space. <coughs> these things are the reflections, right? These three are the transpositions, or the reflections there at this level. Their fixed space, it's a hyperplane. It's co-dimension one, so they're at this level. And then you go up and you get these two three cycles. Their fixed space is uh, Remember, I've modded out by the hyperplane where the coordinates sum is zero. Their fixed space is actually zero dimensional. It's only at the origin, it's a two dimensional space. And they're at level two. So, really, there's going to be this graded post set, this ranked post set. And I'm actually thinking of the, the uh, Cayley graph as this, this ranked post set, this undirected Cayley graph. And who are the non crossing partitions? It's only the ones that I encounter going from the identity up to this Coxeter element, which I fixed. And it only excludes this guy. That's the only thing. So another way of saying it is, in this partially ordered set that I've defined, the non-crossing partitions are the things which lie below this Coxeter element. That's another way of saying they lie on a geodesic, the shortest path between the identity and the Coxeter. So it's these five. One, two, three, four, five, not this one. And that's our Catalan number. The Catalan number for A2 for S3 is 1 over 4, 2 times 3 choose 3. It's whatever, it's 5. So that's, we're counting that. Any questions about this picture? I'm about to approach the next one, so maybe um, it'll get an answered. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, is the terminology for non crossing in, um, in the A in case you put the dots in a I mean, I mean, the next. Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you for the questions. You'll be paid later. Um, right, so uh, let me just say what's up here. Okay, so the next Catalan number is a 14. All right, we do the calculation. So who are the 14 things inside type A3, the symmetric group S4? It's what Max said. Now we realize, aha, it's the non-crossing set partitions of the numbers one through four in a disguised form. So this actually goes back to a paper of Philippe Mian. He observed this many years ago, before the, the Brady and Watts paper. Um, so the non-crossing set partitions, what do I mean? Think of one, two, three, four up through n as written clockwise around a circle. And think of I, I've drawn again these permutations as you know these functional digraphs where, where things are going, but just ignore the arrows for the moment. And you could think of them as blocks of a partition. So this one that I'm pointing at right here, this is the partition of the numbers, the set partition of the number of one through four, in which I have a block one, two, four, and a singleton block three. Whereas this one has one, two in a block, three, four in a block. 
and they're called non-crossing set partitions and had been considered many years ago by uh, Germain Creveras. He was, I think, the first in the combinatorics literature to look at the non-crossing set partitions. They're the set partitions in which when you place the numbers around the circle clockwise and you take the convex hull of elements in a fixed block, they don't cross each other. The blocks just stay apart. And if you orient them clockwise, Philippe Beyond realized, oh, this is the same thing as, uh, I can't get them all on the screen at the same time, let's make it smaller. It's exactly the same thing as the elements between the identity and this fixed Coxeter element, where one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to one. And in general, that end cycle is the product of the adjacent transpositions, one, two, two, three, three, four. So it is a Coxeter element. And Beyond realized that this is a bijection between these non-crossing partitions for the symmetric group and the non-crossing set partitions. Okay, so these diagrams are setting up that correspondence. This is supposed to explain in type A the source of the terminology. I call them W non-crossing for an arbitrary real reflection group and what is non-crossing E. But in type A, this is why it is that's the source of the terminology. Okay, so the claim is that this happens in general. This is cross. That uh, for any finite real reflection group, that cat of W is counting these non-crossing partitions. But better yet, in fact, cat W of Q, I Qify in that silly way, seemingly, and you get one of these cyclic sitting phenomena. So my set X is these non-crossing partitions for W. X of Q is that Qification of that product, a strange product. We weren't even sure that it's an integer or a polynomial, but I'll, I'll get to that. And what's the action? Well, so when you have non-crossing set partitions in the type A case, you just rotate the pictures. The rotation of set partitions gives you a non-crossing set partition gives you another non-crossing set partition. So you get a, a Z mod NZ action. The right way to generalize that turns out to be conjugation of the elements of NC of W. You conjugate by powers of the Coxeter element. So recall the definition was that it was these things that lie on a geodesic between the identity element and the Coxeter element, using all the reflections in your Cayley graph as your upward moves or your edges. So this picture, when I conjugate by the Coxeter element, here are the, the transpositions at the bottom. That's a conjugacy invariant set. I'm using transpositions to define my edges. And if I'm uh, lower than the, the Coxeter element, when I conjugate by powers of the Coxeter element, I will still be lower. So this whole picture is invariant under conjugation by little c. So that's the correct cyclic group action. So it's a group whose order is ah, z mod hc. So why is that number h called the Coxeter number? It's not because of originally the invariant theory, but little h is the order of the Coxeter element. So remember I said Coxeter elements, you had to make a choice, but it's they're all conjugate to each other. They all have the same multiplicative order. And it's one of the non-trivial parts of the numerology of the subject that the order of any Coxeter element is the highest degree of a homogeneous basic invariant. It's not obvious. Little h, the fact, I, I defined it first as the top degree, but it's also equal to the multiplicative order of any choice of a Coxeter element, which is not obvious. And in fact, I mean, really, the numerology, so one of the magic pieces in the story is that the eigenvalues of the Coxeter element give you the, uh, the basic degrees in an acute way. There are, there are roots of unity. You look at what primitive roots of unity you get, what powers of a primitive. And those are the exponents of the hyperplane arrangement and, and so on and so forth. And they also give you the fundamental degrees when you add one. Which definition came first? I think it's the order of C. Uh, that's a good question. Do you know me? I think it's the order of C. 
ordered C came first. And later it was realized that it was related to the fundamental degrees. I should get that history straight. I, I actually don't have that right at the top. All right, so just to give you an example. So here's again one of these cyclic sieving you know, verifications. For S4, here was our Q Catalan number now. It's 1 over 5 sub Q, H used 4 sub Q. It's this polynomial. Nice, nice long polynomial there. Now I should be doing a Z mod 4 Z action, okay? Because this is the, it's going to be rotating these, these pictures inside the S4, these non crossing partitions. And um, so we do the evaluations at fourth roots of unity when I do the zero, zeta to the zero. So zeta is now i, a fourth root of unity is just a complex number i. Plug in q equals one, yes, we're getting the total number of those non-crossing partitions, of course, I said it was a q analog. But if I plug in uh, q equals negative one, so that would be i squared, I should be getting the number of non-crossing partitions that are fixed by, uh, doing the 90 degree rotation twice, what's well, 180 degree rotation, it's the ones that are centrally symmetric, and I get six when I plug in Q equals negative one here. Who are the six? There's C at the top. That's invariant under 180 degree rotation or conjugation by C twice. Uh, the identity is also invariant under 180 degree rotation, so this set partition in which they're all singleton blocks. And there's this one and its rotation. So there's, this really represents two. And there's this one where four, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, <clears throat> this one, when you rotate it uh, 180 degrees, you get back the same thing. And there's one where you, it's 90 degree rotated partner. It gives you another one that's fixed, and this one where four is singleton and two is singleton and one and three are together in a block, invariant under 180 degree rotation, and it's got a, a partner and you rotate it by 90 degrees. So one, two of these, two of these, and one is just a six. And there are, in this case, actually a couple of them that are fixed by everything. So when I put in Q equals I, zeta to the first, you should be getting the non-crossing partitions that are invariant under 90 degree rotation, and that's just C at the top and the identity at the bottom. <coughs> yes, John. If I consider the polynomial mod q to the 4 minus 1, yes. does that polynomial unqify to some number related to the Catalan number? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're starting the Catalan number and qify. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then you take mod q to the 4 minus 1. Yeah. You get this polynomial that picks up these orbits. Right? Yeah, there's six orbits okay. total. And, yeah. Well, that's a a Q polynomial sort of, right? There is some, uh, I'm just wondering if, if there is a number underlying that Q polynomial back in the unqified uh, situation. Just plug in the one. But, but whenever I think of unqifying, I said Q equal to 1. So <laughs> it's still 14, right? 6 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2 is still the 14. 14. I see that modding out doesn't I change. I just kind of, you know, uh, shrunk so the exponents on the Qs, but I still see. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't mean anything. This guy is, is not so meaningful, right? Somehow it's not a beautiful thing that's hard to remember, whereas the Catalan formula I can remember. Yeah. Purification does not well define the well defined operation. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Qification is in the eye of the This could be considered a Q analog in the Catalan number, too, because it specializes the word. Right. But somehow my feeling is like, I can't remember this one. This is not the right way to encapsulate the data. It's like the other thing is the mm -hmm. Before you encountered this problem, how did you enumerate these orbits? Ah, yes. Well, we're combinatorialists. We do this all the time. <laughs> I mean, we roll up our sleeves. It gets grungy. But I, I shouldn't admit it in public that we do this. Um, yes. Okay. So I should be uh, you know, finally saying something about why this why is this thing actually a polynomial? It's invariant theory again. It is a polynomial with integer coefficients, even with non-negative integer coefficients, this, this product. And, uh, but it's, it's a bit of trickier invariant theory. Let me tell you. So it comes up 
in the people who do rational Turinic algebra. So I, I don't want to get into what they are. There's some interesting uh, kind of uh, algebras, uh, finite dimensional algebras, whose, uh, at least if we're working with finite real reflection groups, uh, and they came up in work of Ian Gordon. He was trying to understand some of the conjectures that Mark Heyman had made about the ring of diagonal harmonics and so on, if you've ever heard this stuff. Gordon had a different approach to some of these conjectures. And uh, these guys, uh, Yuri Beres and Pavel Edingoff and Victor Ginsburg, roughly around the same time, they have paper, there's a paper by Gordon, there's a paper by these three, which actually quote each other. You know, they were in communication and they needed some of each other's results, so they're sort of intertwined. But here's something invariant theoretic that explains this Q Catalan for us. And this is the only way I understand that this Q Catalan has, is a polynomial in Q and has non-negative coefficients. I do not have an alternate explanation for it in general. So we need this for the moment. Take an irreducible real reflection group. We have our usual situation where we have the polynomial algebra. Now I'm not going to look at the W invariants yet. First, I'm going to mod out by something. There's something canonical to mod out by. There exists theta 1 through theta n. These are polynomials. They're each homogeneous of degree h plus 1, the Coxeter number plus 1. So they all live in the same degree, and therefore we can talk about the vector space that they span inside the polynomials of degree h plus 1. They're a system of parameters for us. So if you mod out by these, you get something crawl dimension 0. You get something finite dimensional. Okay, so there's they, they are algebraically independent, and it's a finite extension from the whole polynomial ring to the polynomial ring that they generate. And not only, you know, so I can talk about their span, their C linear span in degree h plus 1 of the polynomials, it's W stable. Right? So it's taken back to itself by W. And better yet, it's like a copy of the variables again, back in degree 1. It's as if you've got, so what, what am I saying? It carry, this W stable space carries the V star representation, the representation on the dual of V, or the same as the representation carried by the variables in degree one. Is this a defining representation? It's not. Uh, I want the contragradient. No, no, it's the representation you started with is a defining representation. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. I like to think of these, this magical system of parameters, theta 1 through theta n, as like a shifted up by h version of the variables. They're like the variables, but they've been moved up in, instead of degree 1, they're in degree h plus 1. By the way, they also occur in degree 2h plus 1 and 3h plus 1. And the rational Cherenic algebra theory talks about why this occurs. See, these guys, Gordon and Barris, depending off and Ginsburg, they were interested in which choices of a certain parameter in the rational Cherenic algebra. There's a, there's a parameter around that they could vary, and they would only get finite dimensional representations of this rational Cherenic algebra for certain choices. And when they do, these theta 1 through theta n, this quotient of the polynomial ring by the theta 1 through theta n, is really carrying that finite dimensional representation. Yes, no. So what, what's the dimension of S mod Q? S mod theta? Is that what you're no, saying? No, S, oh, whatever okay. it is. I cannot be there. S, S mod theta. Theta, yeah. Yeah, it, so because, it, it used Bazoo's theorem right there, degree h plus 1, there's n of them, so the quotient is going to have degree h plus 1 to the n. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that number we should think of as the, the uh, parking function number. So in the diagonal harmonic story, there's the parking functions, and there are n plus 1 to the n minus 1 of them. So in type A, h is n, it's h plus 1 to the n, n is the degree of the irreducible representation, the reflection representation, n plus 1 to the n minus 1. That's, that's the dimension of this quotient space. It's the parking function. And I like to sometimes call this the parking space, the w parking space. Yes, sorry. Okay, so I don't just stick with the W parking space. There's still some invariants that go on. I take the W fixed space, the W invariant space. S mod theta is now my abbreviation for this finite dimensional quotient. Now I take the W invariants in there, and I will get this cap. <coughs> and this calculation is actually 
for the people who know the, the Coxeter group numerology and the basic invariance, so there's a theorem of Lou Solomon uh, from back in the 60s in which he not only uh, you know, knew what Shepard and Todd knew about the W invariance in the polynomials, but he figured out what happens when you take W invariance in the polynomials on V tensored with the exterior algebra on V, so, the, so to speak, the, the W invariant differential forms. He knew how to describe that very simply, again, using the same numerology, <coughs> those fundamental degrees. He gave us a, a description of it as a, so it turns out the invariant differential forms, so this invariance in the polynomials tensor exterior algebra, is again a free module over the W invariant polynomials. You can multiply invariant differential forms by invariant polynomials, you'll get more W invariant differential forms. He described it for us, he told us the Hilbert series, he told us everything, and trust me, knowing that these things had degree h plus 1, you can somehow use a causal complex which is built from this exterior algebra, you get this calculation. In other words, this product Catalan formula pops out from a causal complex calculation that these guys, Gordon, Verish, Eddie, Bob, Ginberg, every, everybody knows how to do this kind of calculation. So I'm not saying this should be obvious to you, but what I want to say is that once you have this, this very special properties for the thetas, this just pops out in the line of calculation. You can't trace the proof of that theorem and somehow get a direct way of proving that the function is polynomial. No, I, I it's buried only, somewhere in some. It's, it's buried. There's some theorem that's used in the resolution. In some sense, Tony, this causal complex, the fact that these yeah. things, they're a system of parameters, therefore they're a regular sequence of causal complexes. Well, exactly. aware of what that gives you. No, but what I want to say is cancellation, yeah. right? There's a resolution, there's cancellation, there's plus and minus signs. That's what kills the combinatorics. We don't know how to get rid of the cancellation. So it's magic. It's magic. So how about this invariant then on S by theta invariant over top of it? Yeah. <laughs> so this W fixed space inside the parking space, that's the Catalan space. Do you, do you know it's Hitler space, but do you know also presentation? Presentation as what? It's kind of lost a lot of structure. As, 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 as an object. Uh, oh, I see. I see. This, uh, you know, this, this is this sine symmetric group that came up in Karen's talk. Type B n or C n, they have the same uh, real reflection group associated with them. It's the symmetries of a cross polytope, the convex hull of plus or minus E i, the standard basis vectors, so sometimes called the hyperoctahedral group or the sine symmetric group. So it acts on uh, polynomials and n variables, both permuting and negating coordinates. And so you don't just have elementary symmetric functions in the variables as your basic invariants, but if you square all the variables, then when you negate the, the variables, the squares are invariant, and so this fixes the problem. And so I claim it's, it's not too hard if you know the fundamental theorem of symmetric functions that the W invariant polynomials under type B vial groups are um, elementary symmetric functions in the squares of the variables. So their degrees are two, 4, 6, up through 2n. Highest degree is uh, h is 2n. That's the Coxeter number. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, this magical system of parameters, this theta 1 through theta n, I can write one down for you. This is not the one that would be given to you by the rational Turendic theory, but there, there's more than one choice of these things. The one that I would write down most obviously is just take powers of the variables, x1 to the 2n plus 1 x2 to the 2n plus 2, etc. So the Coxeter number was 2n. I'm supposed to find up in degree 2n plus 1 a set of 
homogeneous elements that still carry that same signed permutation representation that the variables carry. Because 2n plus 1 is odd, this works. Right? When I take the powers of the variables to the 2n plus first power, they will get permuted by the permutations, and they will get negated when you negate the variables, because it's an odd power. So it's easy to see that this is a w-stable set of uh, homogeneous elements whose quotient will be finite dimensional. If I mod out by powers of the variables, then all I've got left are you know, limited powers of the variables that survive in the quotient. So this is a system of parameters. So you just guessed it? You just guessed a system of parameters? That's not what Gordon and Barrett and Enningoff and Ginsburg do. I'm just saying, in this particular case, I can just guess it. And it doesn't matter which one I pick. Moreover, it's obvious that it is a system. In this case. In this case. Yes. Yeah. I bet I talk about type A. It's not so easy. Anyway, the point is, so I could write down the from here's the the uh, Catalan number is I put the degrees on the bottom, I put the shifts of the degrees by the H on the top. In this case you get two n choose n sub q squared. That's this type B Q Catalan number. It's a, again a, it's just a Q binomial but at Q squared rather than Q. It's, it's fairly simple in this case. And that is, it's not too hard to see that this quotient space where I've modded out by the 2n plus 3 powers of the variables, when I take the w invariance, you could give a direct argument for why this is the Hilbert series of that space. Can I come back to your question now? Yes. So, notice I said that this choice is not the one that the rational theoretic algebra theory would give you. So that ring structure, there's some choices involved based on which thetas I pick. I would have to say, let's take the, the rational Shrednik choice of thetas before I could, in a meaningful way, talk about the algebra structure that you were asking. They all have the same Hilbert series, but the algebra All structure. have the same Hilbert series, but the algebra structure could vary. But it, I still think it's a good question. OK, that's type B. It's not so hard to find the magical thetas. In type A, it's actually quite subtle. And what's my criterion for quite subtle? Uh, Mark Heyman needed Hans Kraft's help back in 1994. So Heyman knew from his theory that he would like to have this in type A, such theta 1 through theta n minus 1. And he didn't quite know how to do it, and Kraft showed him how to do it. Yeah? Uh, are these Gornstein, uh, uh, these supremes? Um, so certainly bef the parking space, before I take the W fixed space, they are yeah. Gornstein. Um, I'm not so sure what they're after with that. I'll have to think about that. Because you're, uh, uh, at least a lot of the examples that you've been putting up with those Catalan numbers that Helen Drummond, right? Yes, which makes me think that they are. Yeah. But I, have, I would have to think about those. I'm not sure. So that's a polynomial ring in this case. Variance. No. No, no, no. I, I mod it out by these powers, so that's... Oh, that kills it. Yeah, it's called dimension zero. There's nobody algebraically independent anymore. And then I took W invariance. No, it's definitely not. Okay. Any further questions? All right. So what about GL on FQ? There's an obvious thing to do. So again, I now believe in the gospel that GLNFQ is an invariant, it's a, a reflection group. It's just, you know, <coughs> in the modular case, it's a reflection group. <laughs> I don't have the rational Cherednik theory. Actually, they, they have thought a little bit about uh, finite dimensional representations of these uh, rational Cherednik algebras in characteristic P, but the theory there is not so well developed and it doesn't give me what I'm saying here. But there's an obvious thing to do. So how do I think of GLNFQ as being a reflection group? It, uh, it acts on the polynomial ring with FQ coefficients. Dixon's theorem told me that the invariant ring is generated by these Dixon polynomials. We heard that their degree was uh, Q to the n minus Q to the first, sorry, Q to the n minus Q to the n minus one, and Q to the n minus Q to the n minus two. I've written the degrees in increasing order, Right, so the, last, the second to last is q to the n minus q, and the last one is q to the n minus 1. 
So I should think the Coxeter number, H, is this highest degree, q to the n minus 1. And therefore, h plus 1 is q to the n. And if I believe in all of this, I should look for a system of parameters in this polynomial ring, theta 1 through theta n, that are all homogeneous of degree q to the n, which are w stable, which are gln fq stable, when I take their fq span. And doing the silly thing, the thing that worked in type b or c, take the q to the nth powers of the variables. Because when you raise things to the qth power, right, and to raising them to q to the nth, you're just doing it many times. You're raising it to the q, and then you raise it to the q again, you're getting raised to the q squared. That's fq linear, right? This is by our favorite, uh, you know, Frobenius maps. And so this is w stable, homogeneous of degree h plus 1. They give a system of parameters because it's just powers of the variables, again. So when you mod out by them, you've got something finite dimensional over fq. And it's not just w stable, but let's think about this. When we take the fq linear combinations of the, these powers of the variables, the variables have been raised to the q to the n, any linear form, it doesn't matter whether it's the variables or not. If I take a linear form, you know, c1x1 plus c2x2, where the ci's are fq coefficients, coefficients are fixed when I raise them to the q or q squared or q to the n. You just take the linear form and you raise it to the q to the n. It commutes with, you know, taking the combinations of the variables raised to the q to the n. So they span a space that just looks like the space of linear forms. It looks like v star back in degree one. It's exactly doing what the magical systems of parameters were supposed to do. They give us a copy of v star which lives in degree 1 of the polynomials, but it now lives in degree q to the n, which is h plus 1. Sorry, I'll see what I'm happy. Maybe I was saying, oh, is this down of the parking space? That yes. So I want to quotient by that. That's the GLNFQ analog of the parking space, <coughs> uh, which I'll do on the next slide. And actually, I didn't have to take q to the n. I can also take you know, q to the m, where m is just another positive integer, and it, this turns out to be a good thing to do. So this is a bit like they exist in degree h plus 1 for real reflection groups. They also agree, exist in degrees 2h plus 1, 3h plus 1. Really, the same thing occurs in all these other degrees, q to the m, not just the q to the n that I began with. And so we said, yeah, we should do this. We should look at the parking space, right? the GLN of q parking space, mod out by these things, s mod theta. So, this is something people in commutative algebra do. The variables generate the irrelevant ideal. M1, uh, sorry, uh, x1 up to xn, you know, like you call that the fracteur m, the irrelevant ideal. This is the Frobenius powers of the irrelevant ideal. So people in commutative algebra do this. They take the generators, they raise it to the, the q or the q squared, you know. The, so I'm modding out by Frobenius powers of the maximal <coughs> ideal. That is glnfq invariant. Sorry, stable. And now I take the invariance under GL and FQ. And the answer actually looks not bad. It's a sum of T power shifts of our QT binomials. We just you know, started computing these things, and those QT binomials show up. And this is conjecture. In this formula, you let M vary for each N, you get the separate it's algebra. True, yeah. So when m is zero, for example, I'm just modding out by the variable, so it's very, if this formula will truncate and give you something stupid, you just get the field back. But for m equals one, two, three, it, it's a very strange thing. These QT binomials, it's m choose k, not n choose k. So there's some strange mixture of the n and the m, and uh, we have this conjecture, we verified it in two variables, you just roll up your sleeves and do it, and I would never want to show you that. It's embarrassing. Um, and so there's a lot of evidence for this conjecture, and I really love, I would love if someone so gave us some idea why this should happen. Is there a chance of form of mimicking formally the previous algorithm? The resolutions 
Minister an analog is that what happens when you try and it's formally to mimic what you saw before? It's a great question. So, in fact, there so people have a version of Solomon's formula in uh, positive characteristics. So there's work of uh, Julia Hartmann and uh, Anne Scheffler, in which they do produce a version of that Solomon formula. So here's the problem. They, they produce the, the thing that, uh, this resolution, and then I have to take, so what do they resolve? They resolve, uh, I don't know what They give us the, they tell us the structure on the, the causal complex, and then I have to take the GLNFQ invariance. And characteristic zero, that's exact. So I, I get an exact sequence after, I started with a resolution which was exact, I take the W fixed spaces and it's still exact and I sum it up with plus and minus signs and I'm happy. They gave me the resolution and it's no longer exact. So there's maybe some you know, higher derived functors. You have to understand. <coughs> That's the problem. <coughs> M equal to N? So M equals N was our kind of original motivating case and I don't know it anymore. So this is like the, the GLNFQ catalog. This thing, uh, this sum, conjecturally, is the GLNFQ catalog. I can't prove that it's you know, equal to the Hilbert series, and even in the M equals N case, I can't prove it. But uh, it's very mysterious. And this is consistent, actually, with a, a certain cyclic sieving phenomenon that I can prove the bad way. I can give you a bad proof for a certain <coughs> cyclic sieving phenomenon that fits with this. Let me not try to explain it, why this would be consistent with a, this phenomenon. And instead, yeah. yeah. I mean, is, this a, is there a way to package all these M's in one formula? I mean, it's like, it's like for each M you have a formula, right? Did you say package all the M's or all the N's? All the M. 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 <coughs> so it's, so, so you can see the sum. Yeah. Yeah. What happens as N increases? Is the M I'm going to be getting to that on the next slide. But, so you, okay. but, uh, but packaging them all. I'm going to be taking a limit on the next slide. Yeah, so I'll that lose the information. It's a good question. And I guess, again, I haven't thought about that enough. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm wondering how far the analogy goes. Is there a, is there a notion of Cox development for GLNFQ? Is there a notion of for sure? Partition? Yeah. So who's the Cox development? Yeah, that's actually getting at this. Who's the Cox development? It's the Singer cycle again, right? Remember? Okay. So now I get to thank you for asking. Those Coxeter elements, which were the products of uh, simple reflections, they are always regular elements in the sense of Springer. In other words, they always have an eigenvector that avoids all the reflecting hyperplanes. People know about the Coxeter plane, you know, this two-dimensional plane that uh, comes up when you're arguing about the eigenvalues of Coxeter elements, how it fits the numerology. There's this real two-space in which the Coxeter element acts by rotation. And when you complexify that, you get the zeta and the zeta inverse eigenspaces for it, and those are regular vectors. So, Coxeter elements are regular elements in the sense of Springer. Singer cycles, I should have already convinced you, are the analogs of like n cycles. They are the regular elements in the sense of Springer for GLNF. <coughs> so, Singer cycle equals Coxeter element. And, and Notice it has order h. Coxeter. Yeah, yeah, Singer cycles have order. What about yeah. cross partitions? There? That's the other half. That's good. Again, I'll pay you later. <laughs> so yeah, hold on to that. Okay. All right. And so <laughs> here's one that is even more strange that uh, hadn't been considered. So this ring, when I mod out by the powers of the variables, this is a Gorenstein. So Gorenstein means that you have a, a perfect pairing between a given degree i and the complementary degree for whatever the top degree. Here the top degree would be 
n times kidney on minus 1. So this quotient ring, when I take the top degree monomial that survives, it's the only thing in, in that top degree. And you're supposed to think of that as the orientation class if this is the cohomology of a manifold. And you have Poincare duality, the, the multiplication map that goes from degree i to that top degree minus i is a perfect pairing. That's what Gorenstein means in this context. So if you use the Gorenstein duality in this thing before I took the GL and FQ invariance, and then you take a limit as n goes to infinity in this form, so there's some you know, generating function manipulation, we got to this conjecture, which again, you can prove it in two variables. I'd love to see some ideas on this. Instead of taking the GL and FQ invariance in the polynomial ring, which is Invariance, you should think of as, if you're not in a semi-simple situation, if your group's not adding, acting semi-simply, it's copies of the trivial representation at the bottom of composition series. There are the pieces in filtrations where G is acting trivially. It's the biggest sub space on which G acts trivially. But if you're in a non-semi-simple situation, there's this dual object, the, the GLN fixed quotient. It's the pieces that can appear at the tops of composition series or filtrations where GLN acts trivially. So that's what this fixed quotient is. Take the polynomials, you mod out by the FQ linear span of polynomial minus its, its images under the group. So you're setting polynomials equal to their images under the group and quotienting by that. That's the the fixed quotient. In characteristic zero, you wouldn't bother doing this. You would just take its isomorphic to kind of, you know, there's an easy isomorphism to the, the fixed space, the sub, the fixed sub. But this makes sense when you're in positive characteristic. And when you take the limit in that formula, you get something very nice. Okay, it's bigger. What it looks like is you get uh, a constant, so constants survive. You get something that looks like one of these Dixon polynomials in one variable, it's Hilbert series, and then t to the n times it, as if that Dixon polynomial in one variable was getting raised to the n. And then you get a piece that looks like the denominator for Dixon polynomials in two variables, and then the highest Dixon polynomial, but to the n. This degree has been multiplied by n, etc. This looks like the Dixon polynomials in all n variables, and then the highest Dixon polynomial raised to the n is the degree on top. We have no clue why this simple formula holds. It's conjectural, but in two variables, or one variable, it's been verified by the embarrassing techniques. And uh, I don't know, there's just not so much invariant theory on these fixed quotients in positive characteristic. There's a lot more on the fixed sub rings, not the fixed quotients. And it's a module over the, the invariant subalgebra, and we don't understand. We have some conjectures about how the resolution of this finitely generated module looks in a few variables, but uh, this this is all mysterious. So that's uh, that's where it stands. Okay, so let's, yeah, I'm I'm going to be getting to what you're saying in the second half, Mike. But let's uh, let's pause for the break here. Five minutes break. Five minute break. Yeah, this, uh, I want to make a comment because Alex asked me another great question, which is where was this thing about the fixed quotient going to come from that thing about the invariance? I'm hiding something. Really, what naturally came from that conjecture about the invariance when you mod out by these powers of the variables had to do with using the Gorenstein duality. You actually get at the top in that quotient, you're really looking at a divided power algebra, a dual to the polynomial algebra. It's this thing called a divided power algebra. When you're in positive characteristic, it's a different kind of an algebra structure. It's kind of complicated. And when we were taking invariance in the Polynomial, or in the divided power algebra, I can really think of it at back in the polynomial algebra as taking this fixed quotient instead of fixed subspace. So I chose to phrase it in terms of fixed quotient 
but this is really the Hilbert series for the divided power and um, algebra invariance also. These two things are vector space dual, and so they would have the same Hilbert series. If you like divided power algebras better, that's another way of thinking of this problem. If you're like me, you, you don't like to divide power and algebra so much. Okay. Any uh, questions before we go on to a different topic here with the GLF Q analogs? Okay. So let me. Um, so here is a, a calculation that is beloved uh, in the combinatorics literature and actually goes back to Hermits in, in a different form. I had that partially ordered set from the identity up to a Coxeter element where I'm multiplying by reflections and the <coughs> co-dimension of my fixed space keeps going, going uh, down as I, as I move up. No, keeps going up. The dimension of my fixed space keeps going down. So that was this non-crossing partition post set. And one thing you can think about when you're counting chains, say maximal chains, chains that move by one step each time, there's another way to think about this, which is why Herbert's cared about it. You could think of it as factorizations of your n cycle, our Coxeter element. So C is my n cycle, 1 goes to 2 goes to 3 goes to n, etc. And I want to think about factoring it into transpositions, all transpositions, not just simple transpositions. So this is not reduced decompositions, but something else. In the shortest possible way so that you don't do any inefficiency. You never kind of go up in that post set and then go back down. I just want to go up, up, up by one step each time. I want to count the number of maximal chains in that partial ordered set. It has a beautiful answer. The answer is n to the n minus 2. It's the same Cayley formula for trees that showed up in Kondra Lee's talk. The number of such factorizations was known to Herbert's is n to the n minus 2. And uh, it actually is rediscovered in the common sort of by a Hungarian mathematician, Danish, uh, in 1959. So sometimes you'll see this credited to Danish. And I want to think of this number of factorizations of the n cycle into transpositions in the shortest possible way, where you're never inefficient. So that the number of steps is actually n minus 1, the dimension of the space, where w acts irreducibly. And so I want to think of this as counting maximal chains in that partial ordered set. So here I've drawn, again, the schematic of the partial ordered set with the identity at the bottom, n cycle at the top, and I multiply by w1, I multiply by w2, and they're supposed to be transpositions, they're supposed to be reflections. So first I go to w1, then w1, w2, w1, w2, w3, until I've factored c as a product of w1, w2 up to w n minus 1. I want to count all the possible such maximal chains. Here was our picture for n equals 3 of that whole post set. So the number of maximal chains is 1, no, no, try this. 1, 2, 3. There are three ways in which I could do it. And my answer was supposed to be n to the n minus 2. So in this case, it was 3 to the 3 minus 2. It's 3 to the first. And there's another uh, more modern, somewhat more modern uh, formula that is quite a bit more general. It says these kinds of factorization <laughs> problems, which Hurwitz was interested in, um, some other ones have, have nice answers. We don't know, you know, sort of answers to the general kinds of factorization problems that he cared about. But here's one that generalizes the previous that uh, Ian Golden and, and David Jackson proved in 1992. It's sometimes called their cactus formula. but I mean, I get into what cacti are. It's just some way of encoding these factorizations. What do they prove? More generally, take the n cycle. This time I'm going to factor it in a minimum length possible way. So w1 up to wl, factor it. And now the wi's, they're not reflections, but they should have cycle type. Uh, yeah, cycle type, <laughs> some fixed cycle type. So I want w1 to have. Uh, cycle type given by a partition lambda super 1. And w2 has a cycle type lambda super 2. And the lambdas, they can be arbitrary. So I just specify <coughs> where the cycle types that my partitions, that my permutations come from. And the crucial thing though is that the L, that I'm doing it in the minimal possible way. That I'm, for these cycle types, I am decreasing the 
uh, co-dimension of the fixed space by the proper amount each time, so that I'm always walking upward in this post set. Right? And they said, this has a nice product form, always. No matter what those cycle type partitions, lambda super one and through lambda super L, they can always give you a nice formula. It's a product formula. It looks like this. It always uses these function n of lambda super i. And what's n of lambda? You write your lambda in multiplicity notation. You write down how many one cycles, two cycles, three cycles. Call those little m's. Little mi is the number of i cycles in lambda. And you write down some multinomial coefficient. This is m factorial divided by m1 factorial, m2 factorial, etc. So that's a multinomial coefficient. You divide by a 1 over m. A special case would be a Catalan number. And you take this product of n, this function, of those cycle types. So it's a pretty general kind of an answer to this problem. So let me, again, schematically, I'm factoring my Coxeter element, my n cycle. I'm factoring it where first I take a, a step that goes up, and the cycle type of what I multiply by is lambda super 1. Second step, it had cycle type lambda super 2. Third step, had cycle type lambda super 3. The number of ways in which I can go up, 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 never kind of backwards and down. That's the crucial thing. It's given by this product formula. N to the number of steps minus one in this, <coughs> this thing. So it's quite nice. And let me show you, you know, what <coughs> the case we already saw. The transpositions, they have slight loops. special case. What's their cycle type? It's always 2 to the first, so they have a 2 cycle, and then they have n minus 2, 1 cycle. So in my multiplicity notation, m1 is n minus 2, m2 is 1, and all the rest of the mi's are 0. There are no other i cycles for i greater than or equal to 3. There are no other cycles. So uh, each of these lambda super i's is the same. And so each of these n of lambda super i's are the same, and you just get a 1 over n minus 1, n minus 1 choose 1 comma n minus 2. This is just a binomial coefficient. n minus 1 choose 1. It's an n minus 1, <coughs> and I'm dividing by n minus 1, so I just get 1. Those capital N's are all just 1's. They simplify in this case. And uh, so, and this little l, what's this number of steps that I should take so that I'm being efficient, always moving upward? L is n minus 1. And so you're counting these factorizations of the n cycle into n minus 1 transpositions. We should get their n to the l minus 1 from their formula. L was n minus 1. So you should get n to the n minus 2 times a bunch of 1s gives you n to the n minus 2. This, this number of trees that they were supposed to recover. So I'm pretty OK with this old Jackson formula. So I'm going to want to at least do a Q analog of a special case of this formula. This is quite nice. In fact, I'd like to see a Q analog of this general version of the formula. The, the special case I want to look at, which we've seen recently looks, looks good, is what if instead of uh, the transposition case, which was 2 to the first and then 1 to the n minus 2, so one non-trivial cycle of size 2, what if we just let you have one non-trivial cycle in each case? So the lambda super 1, that first cycle type, has an alpha 1 cycle and then singletons. The lambda super 2 has an alpha 2 and then singletons, and so on. Excuse me. Please. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I just lost the definition of cycle type. Do you, do you mind repeating that? Oh, sure. So when I have a permutation and I, I write down its cycle structure, yeah. and I get a number partition the number one, of the number n, if it was a permutation in Sn which is tell me how many one cycles there are, how many two cycles, how many three cycles. So that's what I'm calling the cycle type, the number of partition associated. So it's specifying the conjugacy class of the element of a permutation by a number partition. And so uh, this is another case where, the, and it's well known you know, to the people who do this, this kind of Hurwitz problems, that again, when you have just a single part 
but it's non-trivial. So a single cycle that's non-trivial, and the rest of them are fixed points. This N formula again comes out to be a one. That was all that we needed. So those capital N's go away. You get a whole bunch of ones here, and the answer is just N to the length minus one. It doesn't even care about what those cycle sizes, mm -hmm. the non-trivial cycle sizes were in each case in these steps. So the, the formula simplifies, and this one had a, a Q analog, but let me let me tell you why Herbert's cared about this. It's the cycle L depends on the cycle size. The L depends upon the cycle sizes, so the length, but otherwise beyond that it, it didn't depend in any way. What, what are these these Herbert's problems? What's going on here? Just to show people to remind people, um, why did Herbert's care? When you're counting these factorizations of uh, n cycle into fixed cycle types, so fixed conjugacy classes with the symmetric group. If you write down the sum of this, uh, what was I calling it? This L of WIs, the, the co-dimension of their fixed space, you're going to get n minus 1 minus an even number. This, it turns out if you're going to factor an n cycle, then the sum of these co-dimensions of the fixed spaces of the, the elements in the factorization, they always differ when you sum them up from the co-dimension of the fixed space for, for the n cycle. They differ by an even number, and it's two times a g, which is a genus. Because what's happening here is you're specifying for those permutations that are in the factorization, what you're specifying is over these L different branch points what the monodromic permutations are in some branched covering of a Riemann surface. Sorry, you're a branched covering of the sphere by a Riemann surface of genus g. That in order to specify the data of the covering, we need to tell you what the, the monodromy permutations are over all but one of the branch points. And then what this special case is, when you're factoring an n cycle, the last branch points, branch point, I want the monodromy permutation to be an n cycle. So it's a special case of you know, counting these coverings up to some reasonable notion of, of equivalence. It's the special case in which upstairs, um, this could have done, been done by a polynomial mapping. I think of this last branch point as being the point at infinity downstairs, and I think of this as being a Riemann surface upstairs, so g is zero. The g equals zero case exactly corresponds to always moving upward in the post set, always being most efficient, never going backwards, where the length of the factorization is as short as possible. That pins this down to g is zero, and then you can talk about which of these coverings are realized not by uh, rational functions or mere morphic functions, but by polynomial maps of degree n. And so n, the n cycle here, when you have a polynomial map, that's specifying what's happening around the last branch point. And these are specifying the other cycle types. Is, is this purely combinatorial, what you're talking about now? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Herbert's realized that this is really a combinatorial problem. So, so the combinatorics of the surface G, C, G comes from, say, name gone. By gluing, if you want. Yeah. By various constructions. And so where, where, do we, where are we seeing that in, in your picture here? Where, where are we seeing the, the end gone, the combinatorics of the end gone? No, is it, is it really structure. inherently the end gone? I mean, it's a sphere. That it might well, I'm, I'm sorry. You just said it was purely combinatorial. By the end of the day, not at the beginning of the day, because Urbis was looking at the complex structure of the uh, of the underlying topology. Yeah, I, so I guess when we start talking about being achieved by polynomials, right, that word. Okay. 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 Uh, anyway, yeah, that makes one feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much my point, but it, it, it was a reason, you know, why did Herbert's count? This is the question. It's because of this. Okay, so what's the GLNFQ analog of at least one special case in the cactus, cactus formula? <laughs> so I'm going to replace n cycle by Singer cycle in GLNFQ. Uh, so this is the sorry, this is the initial special case that we ran across. I'm going to replace transpositions by reflections, There's arbitrary reflections in GLNFQ. Could be semi-simple reflections, could be transvections. I don't care. 
we noticed that again, when we looked at the factorizations that always moved up in this post set by moving upward, if you decrease your the co-dimension, or sorry, increase the co-dimension of your fixed space, then uh, it had a nice formula again. Instead of n to the n minus two, it was q to the n minus one raised to the n minus one. Okay, and that q to the n minus one. That is the Coxeter number, <laughs> again, that's the H, remember, for GL and FQ, just like N is the Coxeter number in type A, N minus 1. So it, this formula really has a, a very similar feeling, and it convinces us that perhaps we should be thinking of this partially ordered set, the identity at the bottom, the Singer cycle at the top, and we look at the geodesics between them in this, you know, the Cayley graph using all reflections, that this is like non-crossing partitions for GL on FQ. Okay. Maybe has the right to be called this. So this is this is what I was counting here. Small amounts. And this this we ran into first. So here, here's the picture, identity, and then I go up one step, so I'm multiplying by a reflection, by a reflection, by a, by a reflection. I'm making sure I always go up each time. You get this this nice count. Are you okay with this? <coughs> and then, more generally, we decided, okay, we should really <coughs> try to recover something like more of this cactus formula. And then the one that turns out to be very nice is it. As a special case, we wanted to count how many elements there were at a given rank. It looked like it also had a beautiful formula. And then we decided maybe we should actually try to do you know some more counting of these chains going upward. So again, a situation where we got a very nice formula is this. This was actually uh, so Joel Lewis is a postdoc at Minnesota. He was on the the other paper that I was writing with him and Dennis Dan. Jock Wong is a, a PhD student of mine. He was out at uh, Nebraska University. Of, uh, Kearney, Nebraska. So when you look at factorizations of the Singer cycle, and now I'm not going to arbitrarily specify like a single cycle and then fixed points. We're in the general linear group, not the symmetric group. What I'm just going to specify is how much does the co-dimension of the fixed space go up. So what I'm really counting are chains in this partial ordered set, totally ordered subsets, where I first jump by alpha 1, then I jump by alpha 2 in the rank. So the co-dimension goes up <laughs> by alpha 1, then by alpha 2, then by alpha 3, etc. I'm fixing what are the, the sizes of the jumps in the rank. And this has a nice formula again. It, again, we get this Coxeter number, q to the n minus 1. We get the number of steps in the chain, uh, minus 1, l minus 1, and then some q power, which depends on these alphas. I don't know if you can read this q power, but you should probably not worry about it. It's just some sum of the alpha i minus 1 times n minus alpha i, some shift. And it's a, like in that uh, special case of the cactus. The cactus formula doesn't depend so much on the alpha 1 through alpha i, except in that q power. Right? It mostly just depends on how many of them there are, the l number of steps that you take in the chain. And it's quite reminiscent of what was happening in that special case of the cactus formula where we had an L to the, sorry, N to the L minus one when they specified this alpha one cycle and then singletons, alpha two cycle and then singletons. This special case seems a lot like that special case for them. I don't fully understand that analogy. And Okay, so we, we have some formulas, and this is a, a mini course, so I'm going to admit to you, I don't have good proofs of this. I have, so to speak, intermediate proofs. I'm not going to call it a bad proof, but the way in which you can prove the cactus formula, I'm, I'm going to tell you roughly what the method is, because you want to take home some methods, right? You want to learn how you can do some things. So how do you prove these kinds of factorization counts without having to be clever, right? In fact, I'm not very clever. I, I like to avoid being clever at all possible times. I just don't have the wherewithal. That's a subject of another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So really, not every combinatorialist likes to be clever. Sometimes we just like to have tried and true methods. Um, but I, I would like to see a clever proof of these. Even just that first one, a maximal change. This q to the n minus 1, raised to the n minus 1. It was very analogous to the maximal change from the non-crossing cartoons. I would love to see a nice clever bijective proof. <clears throat> I don't know one. Instead, I want to just tell you in the remaining little bit, uh, a tried and true general method for these factorization problems. It's funny, it came about like right after uh, Herbitz was writing his paper, so Frobenius. He was developing you know, some of the theory of, of group characters. So again, Frobenius had a general method for counting factorizations of an element in which you pick your factors coming from certain conjugacy classes, or at least conjugacy closed sets, certain unions of conjugacy classes. He tells you how to do this using, again, ordinary tame character theory. So this is another one of these advertisements for why your students should learn just complex characters of finite groups, finite dimensional representation. So how, what does Fermanius tell us to do? He says, you want to count factorizations of some fixed element in terms as a product of W1, W2 up to WL, and WI comes from some conjugacy closed sets, K1 up to KL. WI comes from KI. He says, you can just rewrite this number as uh, an average, one over the order of your finite group. You sum over all the irreducible complex representations of your group, so it has to be a group like the symmetric group where we know those complex representations, and you have to know something about their characters. And for GLNFQ, we know enough about their characters. You take the degree of the irreducible character, you take the value on the thing that you're factoring, and you take the normalized value when you sum over these conjugacy closed sets. So these chi tilde of ki just means sum, with, sum over the elements in that conjugacy class or that conjugacy closed set, the character values, and divide by the degree of the character dimension. Just some character computation. Okay. And what happens is, <laughs> why does it work so well when you're trying to do n cycles? You know, I said that Hurwitz's problem in general, if I specify arbitrary monodromy over that last point and arbitrary monodromy permutations over the other points, we don't actually have a good formula in general. What limits us sometimes <coughs> is the ability to use this approach of Frobenius. When you have an n cycle, something really nice happens. Remember that irreducible characters of the symmetric group, Sn, they're indexed by partitions of n. Most of the characters vanish on the n cycle. So remember what that formula had in the bottom. Right there, there's a, a product, it's a product inside the sum. This thing vanishes, chi of an n cycle vanishes for most of the irreducible characters in the symmetric group. Vastly simplifying this thing. Okay? So n-cycle factorization problems are easier. And then, the, what are the irreducible representations of the symmetric group for which the, the character doesn't vanish on an n-cycle? It's only these hook characters where you have uh, a bunch of ones, k ones, and in the first row you have n minus k, you know, a single part. It's, non-trivial. These characters you should perhaps think of as exterior powers of the reflection representation. So this is something nice about the symmetric group is it's only exterior powers of the reflection representation that have non-trivial values on n cycles, on this particular, on the Cox elements. And their degrees are easy to write down. There's some you know, binomial coefficients. So Frobenius' theorem simplifies. It's just a sum over 1 over the size of the symmetric group. <clears throat> sum from k going 0 to n minus 1 of some uh, minus 1 to the k from a character value, uh, a degree here, and then you have to compute these things, and it turns out there's enough theory here. So I'm, I'm giving the, the quickie version of, this is actually the preferred proof of Don Zagier for the, the cactus formula. So I'm giving you Zagier's proof of the cactus formula. These character values turn out to always be a polynomial in k. Remember, k was the size of the hook. It's the size of the exterior power. How many exterior power do you think? The answers are always polynomial in k. They're, you don't need to know everything about them. You just need to know their top coefficient. So the point is, this whole product 
ends up being a polynomial in K, the size of the leg. And this business where you're summing minus 1 to the K and n minus 1 choose K, it looks horrible. Now you're just taking an n minus first forward difference. This is what happens when you take forward differences of functions. So what do I mean by a forward difference? The first difference of f at 0 is the value at 1 minus the value at 0. The second difference is the first difference of the first difference. And you get the value of 2 minus 2 times the value of 1 plus the value of 0. The third difference, you're getting the value of 3 minus 3 times the value of 2 plus 3 times the value of 1 minus 1 times the value of 0. In other words, binomial coefficients come in for obvious reasons. And these minus signs come in, and that's exactly what was happening inside the Frobenius formula when you do this. So what happens is you just need to know for these polynomials what happens when I take their n minus first forward difference, their polynomials of degree n minus 1, it just, they're controlled by the leading coefficients. So let me just say, there's a bunch of little details in here that turn out to all work beautifully. You don't need to have much information about these polynomials, and it leads to this, this cactus formula. Just knowing the leading coefficients in those polynomials is easy to get at no matter what the, the lambda i is, no matter what the cycle type. And then what happens in the GLNFQ analog? Guess what? We know enough of the GLNFQ ordinary character theory. I'm talking still complex characters, finite dimensional complex characters. This was worked out by Green, J.A. Green in the 50s. And those uh, n minus 1 choose k's, those, there's, again, Singer cycles, most of the irreducible characters vanish on Singer cycles. Just like for the symmetric group, most of the character values vanish on n cycles. The same happens for the general linear group. You get the same sparsity in that formula. You need some character degrees. They turn out to be Q analogs of those n minus 1 choose k's. Character values have some minus signs. Instead of n minus first differences, you get some Q differences. So people who do like Q series and the orthogonal polynomials, they know about these like Q differences and they use them all the time. And it all works. So I'm just giving you the, the brief version is you do the Q analog of the previous story and uh, that works. So I just want to say thanks for listening and, and thanks to the um, CRM. SLNFQ and GLNFQ, you just basically have all the finite, there's the finite, the, I mean, sorry, there's the subgroups of FQ cross, right? Yes. You can restrict the determinant to a line of subgroups. And yeah, we, we have not carried out the analog. So in the classical non-classical partition story, the number of chains is counted by parking functions or something like that. So is there a version of that for GLNFQ? You know, the interesting thing is, it's actually got this other formula, this formula that comes up in the Yashku Tenga covering. It's a formula, it's not the parking function number, it's sort of strange. In type A, it is a parking function number for maybe AN minus one or AN minus two, but there's another beautiful proper formula. It's got like a Coxeter number raised to the rank, it has the order of the group on the bottom, and I think the rank factorial. Rank factorial, Coxeter number raised to the rank divided by the order of the group. This is this observation of uh, Chapaton and Tolkien's. And uh, yeah, there are, actually people have some conjectures about the cyclic sibling phenomenon for human analogs of those, but I'm not fully explored. Do I have a question? I yes, asked a lot of questions. It's all used up. It's very strange. Any other questions? Before we thank our speaker again, perhaps I should remind you that if you would like to take advantage of the restaurant, perhaps you should sign up before you go. So that was a very lucid set of lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is